Good morning, everyone. Good morning to our speakers, distinguished guests from the government, the diplomatic community, the academe, and think tanks. I'm attorney Karen Jimeno, host of CNN Philippines' The Way Forward program, and director and chief legal counsel for SoftCap Partners Private Equity. I will be your host and moderator today. On behalf of Stratbase ADR Institute, I welcome you all to the forum entitled Protecting the Seas, Preserving Biodiversity Through Marine Protection in the West Philippine Sea. The West Philippine Sea hosts security risks, including gray zone operations, environmental degradation, energy crisis, food crisis, among others. While diplomatic and military initiatives are employed to assert the country's territorial integrity and sovereignty, concerns regarding the state of the area's biodiversity and environmental resources persist. Efforts in the West Philippine Sea have been expanding to include initiatives on marine protection as well as on responsible and sustainable tourism that contribute to protecting its biodiversity. This includes legislative and regulatory measures to declare the territory as a marine protected area to regulate activities harmful to the marine environment. Such an approach to the West Philippine Sea emphasizes the vital role of scientists, environmentalists, and local government units to secure the Philippine territory while enriching its natural resources. Today, we will be joined by key experts on maritime security and the environment who will discuss policy initiatives and studies to conserve the environmental diversity of the West Philippine Sea and the current initiatives to declare the territory as a protected area. To open today's discussion, let us welcome Dr. Moya Colette, Deputy Chief of Mission of the Australian Embassy in the Philippines, for her opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Magandang Umaga. It is a pleasure to be with you all here today to discuss the important topic of marine protection. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to express my sadness about the recent oil spill in Mindoro. Australia stands with the Philippines in protecting the marine environment, and we are currently working with our Philippine colleagues and international partners to work out the best ways Australia can assist the Philippines in response to this environmental tragedy. Maritime nations like Australia and the Philippines understand the importance of our marine environment for the sustainable health of our planet, our livelihoods, tourism, and leisure. Water makes up approximately 71% of the Earth's surface, 97% of all of Earth's water, and around 80% of all animals and plant life are found in our oceans. But the marine environment is under threat from pollution, climate change, and over-exploitation. And it is more important than ever that we work together to protect it. And we are proud to support the Philippines in its efforts to preserve the marine environment and become more climate change and disaster resilient. Australia's relationship with the Philippines spans defense and security, development and education, trade and investment, and people-to-people -people links. One area that is going from strength to strength is our maritime cooperation. Given the importance of maritime security and marine environmental protection to Australia, we are investing 3.6 billion pesos in regional maritime programs, and the Philippines is a significant beneficiary. For example, we are funding a number of coral restoration projects throughout the Philippines, including in Pangasinan and Verde Islands, and in the West Philippine Sea in Palaw Palawan and Zambales. In fact, just last week, I was delighted to visit Pangasinan to see one of our coral restoration projects firsthand. I visited a project site in the beautiful Hundred Islands National Park. Devastatingly, it had been hit by a significant coral bleaching event, which destroyed many of the corals. 
Amazingly, funded by the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, Australian and Filipino marine biologists have been working together on groundbreaking science to breed coral lava and rejuvenate healthy coral reefs on sites that had been destroyed. And it's working. And this technique has been taken back to Australia to help restore the Great Barrier Reef. This is what true partnership is really about. The Australian Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation is also collaborating with the Philippine Department of Environment and Natural Resources to measure the extent of marine plastic pollution in Philippine waters and to improve litter monitoring and mitigation. This is to ensure fewer plastics end up in our precious oceans to harm our marine habitats. Through our Marine Resources Initiative, Geoscience Australia is providing geospatial mapping of maritime features in the West Philippine Sea, in part to determine the climate resilience of islands in the area. And the Australian Institute of Marine Science, through the Palawan Council for Sustainable Development, is assisting with best practice coral reef data collection and monitoring. This is key to understanding the impact of climate change and testing the climate resilience of corals in the West Philippine Sea. These are just some of the things Australia is doing with the Philippines to address the challenges faced by our seas, to protect them and increase their resilience in the face of significant environmental challenges such as climate change. Australia highly values its maritime partnership with the Philippines, and we will continue to work together to, pro to protect marine biodiversity, which is so important to the health and prosperity of our two nations. I thank you all for coming today, and I look forward to hearing the presentations to follow from our eminent speakers on this important topic. Maraming salamat and mabuhay. Thank you, Dr. Moya. It was truly enlightening to hear about the restoration projects of Australia, and we look forward to working with your government in the future. Our first speaker for today is Maria Carmel Ablan Lagman, doctor. She is a full professor in the biology department of the De La Salle University, Manila. She is a member of the Center for Natural Science and Environmental Research, where she is also the coordinator of the Technologies for Biodiversity Use and Utilization Unit. To deliver her discussion on declaring the West Philippine Sea as a marine protected area, let us all welcome Dr. Carmen Ablan Lagman. Good morning. Thank you for having me here this morning. May I have like the first slide, please? So I'm giving a talk called Hope for the Biodiversity Resource in the West Philippine Seas. Next slide, please. You know, finding new species, species new to science, is not new for the Philippines. We are the center of the center of marine biodiversity. In 2015, the California Academy of Sciences came on an expedition to study diversity in the Philippines, through which they discovered over 100 new species. Please click. You have a clicker. So these are some of just the pictures that they kept on seeing in these places. Biodiversity creates the conditions for human existence and the ability to survive. It provides the water we drink, the air we breathe, the food we eat, the shelter. And without this, very, uh, very, very, uh, okay, without these very delicate conditions, life is not even possible. So diversity, biodiversity is responsible for, for processes that sustain life and they are in danger. Next slide, please. So I'm just showing you some of the pictures. Um, maybe you can pass me the clicker if you want. OK, next slide, please. So the danger of the Philippine reefs is great. Because of overfishing and overharvesting of the endangered species, biodiversity is in, at risk as well. Because of habitat destruction from destructive fishing practices, and even coastal development. Now, all of that stress is even 
uh, even magnified for the inevitable conditions such as oil spills, particularly in areas where vessel traffic is very high. This is like a given, it will happen. And how do we respond is something that we have to worry about. The other thing that happens is climate change. The warming oceans creates conditions that would actually prevent recovery of resources. You know, natural resources will recover, but they will need time. Now, we might feel trapped and inevitably you know, discouraged by all these stories, but we can look to the West, and maybe there will be things that we will, be, hope, will provide us hope. This features, this features to the west of the Philippines, the Bajo Masinloc and Kalayaan group of islands altogether are now declared the West Philippine Seas. The first question we would like to ask is perhaps why did the features get there and how are they there? So the Kalayaan group of islands is in the EEZ of the Philippines from the Spratly Island. And it's located 270 nautical miles northwest of Puerto Princesa. Palawan is the municipality to which it belongs. So the land forms above water, if you would see there, up would be Bajo Masinloc, and there are seven occupied islands and two reefs towards the KIG. So how did they get there? Tectonic events very similar to what has happened in the mountains here in the land have happened underwater. And the horsts were created that created all these features which we now see above water. Now as the horsts were eroded or were subducting, they now create different, ki different stages of atoll formation because the crests are where the marine organisms have decided to create their own living conditions. Here's an aerial view of some of the features. From the Horst area, we could now see tiny islands. These are the islands barely 500 meters in height around those features. And some of them will actually be sub underwater and we don't see it. So we have various things called rocks, islets, islands, case, reefs, fringing reefs, and atolls. So this is Pagasa Island. So Kalayaan Island, Pagasa Island, and the single strip, airstrip that we have around that island. This is the biggest island that has been developed in feature, of the features of, under the Philippine jurisdiction. This other area is Masinloc, uh, is Bajo de Masinloc. It's uh, about 127 nautical miles from Subic Bay. And it is, a, as you would see, a developed atoll. The center island has subduct. And you have a lagoon which is very, very productive. This is also called the Panatag Shoals or the Scarborough Shoals. So the same biogenic processes that created the organisms actually also created the sediments over Cenozoic era, which is what is very important in terms of the occurrence of oil and gas reserves. The other thing that is featured in the Philippines uh, is the monsoons, which creates the weather patterns that change every six months. All of these bring together the biodiversity we see. Now, let me quickly walk you through a coral. This is a coral and one of the biggest enigma of humankind. Those tiny lip polyps are the individual individ organisms that make up a coral. And the coral in itself, the feature you see, is the exoskeleton to which the tiny polyps actually develop. As juveniles, these polyps are in the water, and they eventually settle. As you would see over here, where you would have the polyps die, and another polyp sits on top of it, and then that polyp dies within a year or two years, and then another one sits on top of it, and that is how a coral grows. The corals create the structure you see on the left, which eventually create the reefs which could be seen even from the moon in the case of the Great Barrier Reef. So you could imagine how those tiny little coral polyps actually develop reefs the way we see it would be millions of years. And to destroy one of them would really be destroying millions of years of processes. For the fish, habitats such as mangroves, seagrass, and coral reefs are all necessary for them to survive where they are. And without this chain of habitats, the fish we see in the, in the area will not come to be. And these are just examples of some of the reef fish that we see in this area. 
So way back in 2009, the DNR has created this area discussion on the key biodiversity areas for protection in the Philippines. These included uh, a discussion on the latest scientific information and the and the um, experts along the field from terrestrial marine and marine environments. So around 228 sites were declared as priority sites for conservation in the Philippines. Part of that would be Masinloc and the KIG. Just to show you some of the work that we're doing in De La Salle University, this is Leoptosperis kalayaanensis, a new species of coral that was discovered by Dr. Liquanan and Dr. Alinio way back in 2009. Compared to other Leptoceres species, this one had longer spines and a wider base, and it was found 15 meters down on the island of Investigator Reef. Our work as well, oops, sorry, works on tintinids. These are ciliates in Masinloc and Zambales, and we have tried to look into them as possible indicators of water quality in the area, particularly with these um, small uh, zooplankton. The other thing that we've done was work with coral, with um, giant clams in the area with uh, West Palawan University as well, Western Palawan University, and partners around uh, Taiwan and the Academia Sinica. Sorry. So, our sale in 2020 tells us that the KIG and Masinloc would have these um, metric tons per kilometer, square kilometer per year yield, and which is very similar to what you will find for Apo and Subilon Island, which are well-protected reefs. The other is the national average is just half of that, and therefore the reefs out there in Masinloc and KIG are definitely very productive reefs. Remember that the key, the key biodiversity areas were areas for protection, and they were not just areas to be protected from people to destroy the area, but they were areas of hope because they would have resources much higher than what is in the national places, and the, the intention is maybe they would be able to seed the areas to which are being devastated. So this is Reefs at Risk Revisited. I was also involved in this project way back in 2012 with the World Resources Institute. It looked into the risk factors for the reefs all over the world. And if you would see KIG out there in Masinloc, they are yellow. Whereas the whole Philippines is really moving towards red or dark red. So indeed, those reefs have resources that would be way above or higher than where we have now where we are, and they are the areas of hope. So I was also working with a group in 2022. This involved Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Taiwan, the Philippines, South in the South China Sea area. And we worked on looking into supporting the conjecture of John McManus way back in 2002, that the reefs and the Spratlys actually seeded the areas based on circulation patterns. And the collaboration actually brought us together to come up with the idea that indeed, those reefs will be very important. Way back in 2017, almost 20 years after we did this eff effort, you would see I, I put there um, a picture earlier. What we had was three generations of research scientists, John McManus and Kwang Xiao Xiao, who were the oldest among us, us who were just starting our careers and our students who we brought towards the same meeting. So the idea of international collaboration and development of like-minded people pursuing the same questions over time is necessary because the resources themselves will take so long to actually develop. I'm almost done. Next slide, please. So that was the international symposium. Okay, so looking at the areas, how many of these are actually protected? If you would see the red areas, they were areas that basically needed protection based on legal uh, declarations. And this is coming from the same DNR report. So the House Bill 6373, Kalayan Island Group, Scarborough Shoal Marine Protected Area Bill, and the Senate Bill in 1697 are definitely welcome initiatives. Looking at how the Philippines requires protection, these are but more, some of the bills that we actually need. 
So what, does this be, what do these bills anchor themselves on? The Nationally Integrated Protected, uh, Protected Areas Management System Program, which would aim to uh, declare these areas one of these others, particularly even uh, other categories established by, con uh, by, con by other aspects. Now, I think the um, issue of being able to do this the area of protection has to be discussed in a larger context of either fisheries management or coastal development. I would just refer you to the case of Masinlog, and you can read about that to see how things need to really be. We have to have a large, a spatially explicit plan that is open to other people for, for sure, there are other interests aside from just protection. But the main issue is, let us not forget that protection gives us water, gives us food, gives us shelter, and the weather is largely a reason uh, buffered by the oceans. So the South China Sea arbitration, after this also came out from De La Salle University, has a lot of language that were related to fisheries. So one of them in the arbitration was that the CITES was, there was a failure to implement the, in, in, uh, the trade in endangered species. And that was caught by the fishers in the area. The other reason for the um, written there in fisheries was the unilateral declaration of a no fish zone by one state, by China over us. And the third one was prevention of the fishers from coming in Filipino fishers are coming into the area. Now, if you look at the, the policies, I'm sorry, yeah, very sm small. I would actually want to put China there as well. Because when I did this, this was with other countries. And just looking at the gross domestic tonnage, the, the separation of the zones, the, the, the gear that can be used in certain areas, there is a lot of conflict. And as each state implements its own policies, on whoever sits in that area, inevitably there will be conflict. So I just know that China does import, import uh, instigate a May to August no fishing ban. And that is the reason they're pushing away people from many of these areas. And then if you would see there, Malaysia's fishing zones are also very in contrast with ours. They have four, we have two. And so I think one of the major things that we can do is really talk about harmonizing this without, without a prejudice to claims of different countries, as you would cite this. Now, what worrisome also, what is worrisome also, is the, uh, the Coast Guard to Fisher interactions is now also including Fisher to Fisher interactions. Whereas Coast Guards are implementing these policies that are really not in sync, Fisher to Fisher have also happened. And that may also be one of the reasons we have to make discussions on this. Next slide. And now I end here. Moving forward with the Philippines. Actually, we have to have spatially explicit plans that are open to all regarding the marine protection. We really need it. We do not want biodiversity to be out of the studies, but to have long-term buy-in and know that the benefits of this will take time, because you're talking about living organisms, we need to have very spatially explicit, priority-driven designs, which we can see coming on for long term. We have to lo localize our implementation agreements. And please read the discussion on mass in lock if you want to see how those conflict. Now, we have to have practices of our neighbors to study them, to include them also, just to see how they do not match into each other's policies. Remember, long-term protection will require time, and that would mean buy-in, and that would also mean long-term agreements on space. So it's not temporarily, but as well as spatially necessary that things have to be in larger scales. And finally, engage. The WPS stakeholders in research monitoring and cooperation, simple things that scientists can do to put their science into the hands of of the locals, and then we have to look also to the development of a community of researchers. I'm very glad Australia is here because they have some of the most innovative changes. Our lab works on temperature change, and one of the things that we're doing is actually mapping along the Kalayan group of islands, refuge reefs. Reefs like the one that we're 
they're working on in Australia, which have been identified as possible places where things will, sa will be saved in the light of climate change. The other thing will also be temperature tolerant species or populations, like we are doing, like we, you know, example will be the giant clam. So I guess I will end with that. The benefits of law is long term. The scale is not small, both in time and in space. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Carmen, for that exhaustive discussion on why we should declare the West Philippine Sea as a protected area. And it's a pleasure for me to have introduced Dr. Carmen because we are co-scholars under the Fulbright program. Our next speaker is an undersecretary for the Department of Agriculture. Drusila Esther Bayate is the current Undersecretary for Fisheries of the Department of Agriculture. She previously served as Assistant Director for Research, Regulations, and International Engagements at the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources from 2013 to 2022. She also concurrently served as Interim Executive Director at the Department of Agriculture National Fisheries and Research Development Institute from 2014 to 2019 to share her thoughts on securing the livelihood of fishing communities. Let's all welcome Undersecretary Drusila Esther Bayate. Good morning, friends, colleagues. I'm going to discuss today uh, securing the livelihood of fishing communities in the West Philippine Sea. You will note here that we have 12 coastal provinces along the West Philippine Sea. Can I move my lectern here? And uh, they are all there highlighted in the map. So we have 12 of them, uh, Ilocos Norte and Ilocos Sur, and until uh, Palawan. Uh, next slide, please. Where is the forward here? This you will note here that the uh, production, fisheries production by provinces in the West Philippine Sea is about 15% of the total capture fisheries production of the country. And that is uh, about uh, out of a 4.4 million metric tons uh, national fisheries production of the Philippines, around 1.8 million comes from capture fishery and around 274,000 metric tons is uh, produced from the West Philippine Sea. Here we have the number of registered fisher folk along the coastal provinces, and they total 375,000. These are a registered municipal fisher folk. This does not include the commercial fishing sector uh, because most of our fishers now. Um, working or fishing within this area are municipal fisher folk and uh, small scale commercial fishing, fish, fishers. So you will note that the highest number comes from the north and uh, those from Mimaropa, that's Palawan and Occidental Mindoro, that's about 111,000. And um, of course, uh, the, the bigger boats among them come from Region 4A, that's Batangas and Cavite, and also in Bataan and Sambales. What are the threats to the livelihoods of the fishing communities? Of course, it's the climate seasonality. So you will note that the whole year, there's around five to six months 
that they can go fishing due to the fine weather. And the rest is the, what we call Habagat or the Northeast Monsoon. And then, of course, they are subjected to extreme weather events. Of course, uh, like uh, I, the big ones are Typhoon Yolanda before, and then lately Typhoon Odette. And of course, they are subjected to harassments, uh, foreign poachers, even domestic, because of the territorial use rights, no? conflicts. And then, of course, destructive fishing. Why climate seasonality? For the rest of the year, the peak fishing season is starts around uh, the first quarter. You have fine weather starting sometimes December, depending on uh, the northeast monsoon or the habagat. And then they last up to May. And that's the best time for them to go fishing. The rest is already the monsoon season or a typhoon season. So you will note that fishing is really a seasonal activity or livelihood. And then uh, during the same time, we have extreme weather events. And of course, you know that it poses danger to the lives of the fishers, their livelihoods, their gears, and their sea crafts. And uh, harassments, when they go fishing there because of the disputed waters, they are subjected to harassments from our neighbors. Destructive fishing, yes, that's also considered a threat because it results to degraded habitats. And when, when we have degraded habitats, we lose our wild fish populations. What are the interventions of the department, especially the Bureau of Fisheries, to secure the livelihoods of our fishers and the community? Uh, I will just first enumerate them. The, activity, the programs include strengthening capacity of the fishers and the community. And we promote resilient livelihood projects. We try to, uh, after so many uh, extreme weather events, we have learned already how to address and made a little adjustments in our programs with sustainable fishing practices. And then we do regular assessments of fishery resources with partners, the universities, DNR and the rest, and some monitoring, control, and surveillance. Now on strengthening capacities of fishing, fishers and fishing communities, we organize fishers association, or we organize them and encourage them to form cooperatives for enterprise development and technology skills competency. So an example for this is a we organized them, it's, uh, an example this is the organization of the Kinluban Island Group, Agotaya Fisher Folk Marketing Cooperative. We started this in 2013. And uh, they, uh, one, this is one model I would like to show you, wherein the department never gave any financial input to them. Uh, they raised their own capital through their daily contributions in 2014, we registered them with the Cooperative Development Authority in 2014 with an initial membership of only 38. At present now, there are more than 200. And they are in the business of seaweed production and marketing. So their starting capital before was just 38,000 and their current value now is around 9 million. And of course, their production capacity now is 150 metric tons of dry seaweeds. And lately, because of this, uh, of we saw the department, uh, after many years, supported them with a five million worth of seaweed warehouse, where they can consolidate their products and secure their livelihoods because they were before uh, victims of uh, traders who take advantage of their produce and give them low prices. But this time now, they have a very good uh, warehouse. And then during the times that they can sell their product at a good price, they can. So through a very good enterprise development, we see that we can secure their livelihoods and take advantage of the business and trading opportunity. 
Uh, this uh, group also, we note that after so many uh, extreme events, they did not go bankrupt. Uh, the most challenging work in government is to have a sustainable co-ops, cooperatives. We say in government that a cooperative is successful if they start to quarrel. It means they have already enough money. But in this case, you will note that uh, uh, we have a very good one. So we, we try to replicate these models now and uh, spread it throughout the country. The next is we conduct uh, technology skills competency training in partnership with TESDA, and it, they get the certificates. And now also those that have been trained can be hired by other companies, so they have very good opportunities. As uh, sometimes uh, fishing, uh, income only from fishing is quite seasonal, so they can do part-time work with uh, trading companies. And we conduct training on fishery laws for the community, the local government, and uh, in partnership with other agencies, with the maritime police, and uh, on also coastal resource management. On coastal resource management, because they will, this will incapacitate them to formulate their own local fisheries ordinance. And then they, we, we encourage them through this training to have interagency enforcement and collaboration with maritime police, local government units, the local barangay police, and also with the Philippine Coast Guard. And uh, of course, information, education, and communication campaign, especially during the closed fishing season. Uh, we have closed fishing season in Northern Palawan for the for the um, uh, galonggong, we, we say the round scuds. These are their breeding season, so most of them are, are gravid. And during the times that they are gravid or in their sensitive life stages, we, we declare a closed fishing season. And uh, here we do massive IEC campaigns. In promoting resilient livelihood projects, uh, we began to shift after Typhoon Yolanda to fiberglass reinforced plastic boats because uh, in partnership with other agencies, the boats normally are made of wood. So they stop harvesting wood from the forests and we train them by promoting, we promoted the use of the more resilient fiberglass reinforced plastic boats. So the fishermen themselves are provided with materials and they are trained how to do it. And then also they are trained for repair and maintenance. These, uh, these vessels or small uh, boats are given to them sometimes with or without engine and with a package with uh, fishing gears. Normally the, the traditional fishing gears that are used in the locality. And of course, you will note that uh, in 2021, 22, we have distributed this much, 147 in 2022 and 265. That's in Region 1, 3, and in Memoropa. Uh, this project, the Lambaclad Set Net Project, this is a passive gear. You will note that's the design in the extreme left. And uh, this is at the same time used for tuna conservation and management zone, like the PIO program. This combination of the two, uh, that th we distributed three units of Lambaclad set gill net, uh, set net to fisher folk associations in region one, three, and Mimaropa region. So those are the communities in the map that uh, were targeted. And uh, usually, uh, it's some sort of fish aggregating also. The community take turns watching it. Uh, uh, and then uh, they have several schedules, the association for them to go fishing. Uh, they take turns fishing. Uh, another one is the tuna, the payao. This is a fish aggregating device 
for the, we say that these areas are tuna conservation and management zone because these are where the migratory fish stocks also uh, pass through. So you have the, the yellowfin tuna and the big eye, usually yellowfin tuna and the other tunas. And uh, we do that. It's also for them to, uh, these are the areas where they fish. Now we piloted a uh, fuel subsidy in 2022 after the lockdown. Uh, most of our fishers cannot go fishing because uh, there were no sources of livelihood after the lockdown, they did not have capital. And fuel takes up about 50% of the operating cost. So we, in partnership with the Development Bank of the Philippines, we provided them with coupons that's worth 3,000 pesos for them to start go out fishing again. And uh, you will note that we were able to provide help to these fishers, around 12,000 of them. From Ilocos Norte, Ilocos Sur, La Union, Pangasinan, Bataan, Sambales, and Palawan. So uh, there was a, lit a dent in the fisheries production during the lockdown years, and they were able to start again. We introduced seaweed farming, especially in during times that they cannot go out fishing. Uh, they also, we also train them to do seaweed farming, especially uh, for them to have another source of livelihood aside from fishing. So we, we distributed the seaweed seedlings with, uh, with uh, other materials like uh, plastic uh, ropes, floats, and also provided some communities with a seaweed nursery for them uh, to have a sustainable supply of seaweed seedlings. And uh, here in this illustration, this is the. This is one of the co-ops also, uh, the one in Kinluban Island. Some members of that previous co-op are also members here. So, the department through the BFAR provided them with solar dryers, and uh, you will note that that is the warehouse that they were able to build. We provide assistance to women's group, skills training on fisheries post-harvest, value adding of fishery products so that they will be, have more value on their catch. And uh, this is a regular project all throughout the country. Uh, so their produce are bottled and dried fish and they are also trained on uh, food safety standards. And then uh, we provided them uh, with uh, a common service facility and equipment like ice making machine, freezers, chillers, smokehouse, solar fish dryers. BFAR, in partnership with NFRDI and uh, in some uh, instances also with other agencies, also DNR. Uh, but I would like to point out that uh, sometime in April and May of 2022, uh, BFAR and NFRDI jointly conducted fishery assessment surveys in Kalayaan Island Group using the MBDA BFAR research vessel. And uh, they did fishery resource assessments, habitat assessment, and oceanographic survey. Aside from this one, we also have the National Stock Assessment Project which also uh, monitors uh, landed catch in fish ports and in municipal landing areas to have a, an estimate of the status of the wild fish tax. And these are used in, uh, in uh, policy to guide us in, in, in forming policy on fisheries management. BFAR, in partnership with the Philippine Coast Guard, uh, most of the vessel ve BFAR vessels are manned by Coast Guard personnel. And uh, 
and uh, we conduct monitoring, control, and surveillance in partnership with the Philippine Coast Guard. I think these are all the, the initiatives that uh, the department uh, has uh, implemented and are, are also implemented uh, currently. Thank you and good morning. Thank you so much, Yusek Esther. Thank you for sharing with us the initiatives of the government in protecting the livelihood of our fisher communities. And our next speaker is Mr. Mr. Kenjap Hupanda. Mr. Hupanda is the program manager of the Kalayaan Tourism Development Project of the Municipal Government of Kalayaan, Palawan. He is one of the organizers of the Great Kalayaan Expedition, a tourism initiative of Kalayaan, consisting of a seven-day and six-night tour in the islands of Lawak, Patag, and Pagasa, jumping off of Ulugan Bay in Puerto Princesa City, which is Palawan's capital. So for those of us here who haven't been to Palawan, this might be something interesting to you to join this expedition. Mr. Hupanda is joining us virtually to share his thoughts on the Great Kalayaan Expedition, exploring tourism opportunities in the West Philippine Sea. Hi, Ken. Yes, we can see it. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you for this
we will utilize one uh, expedition vessel that will uh, travel uh, in five destinations uh, in the Kalayan Island group for seven days and six nights with 30 persons. And of course, we have a very vast uh, playground for uh, activities like marine sports, uh, sports fishing, and uh, diving, scuba diving. So uh, uh, this is the technical working group that uh, worked on the design of uh, the product. And uh, we have uh, run our uh, maiden voyage last uh, March uh, 19 of this year. And uh, this is the, uh, on your screens right now is the maiden voyage uh, team in Lawak Island. So uh, uh, this is the destinations covered by uh, the Great Kalayaan Expedition, jumping off from uh, Ulugan Bay in the western coast of Puerto Princesa. Then first stop is uh, Lawak Island, which is a bird sanctuary. And uh, next is Patag Island, mm -hmm. or uh, commonly known as the Flat Island. And then Likas Island, a turtle sanctuary, and then Pag-asa Islands. So uh, the Great Kalayaan Expedition is geared towards promoting ecotourism in the West Philippine Sea because uh, we believe that uh, uh, all our environmental initiatives, uh, that it can contribute to all our environmental initiatives like uh, promoting sustainable fishing. So uh, uh, in uh, our current situation right now in uh, Pag-asa Island, almost 95% of uh, our local population depends on the sea as their main source of livelihood. And uh, most of the people or all of uh, uh, the fishermen are engaged in uh, commercial fishing. So uh, if there will be a shift from commercial fishing, if uh, at least 50% of uh, the fishermen in Pagasa Island uh, shift to commercial to to sports fishing or uh, uh, fishing uh, tourism. Uh, we can uh, improve the uh, economic conditions of uh, our local fishermen in Pagasa Island, and at the same time, we can also help promote sustainable fishing. So uh, the, the sports fishing activity uh, designed in this package is uh, will be a highly regulated uh, sports fishing activity. Uh, it will in, involve catch and release uh, fishing. And uh, with this, uh, the average income of a local fisherman, uh, of a local fisherman can be improve to uh, from 500 pesos per day to at least 1,500. That is just operating a uh, local boat, a, a, a small boat for, for, uh, fish, for fishing enthusiasts. So uh, we have also included some uh, environmental protection activities in the package. Uh, like a uh, coastal cleanup. So uh, the islands that uh, we have included in this package, if you have, uh, we have visited these islands before and we have checked. And one of the major problems is that uh, there are a lot of uh, trash uh, washed up in the uh, beach. So uh, we have included uh, a coastal cleanup as one of the major activities in uh, the package. And uh, we also plan to work with Palawan Council for Sustainable Development in order to improve uh, the wildlife observation activity to set uh, uh, the exact uh, policies and guidelines on how we can observe uh, wildlife, especially on uh, uh, Lawak Island because so we have a uh, very good uh, uh, sanctuary, very nice sanctuary uh, for birds in Lawak Island. So uh, this is the current uh, product pricing for the Great Kalayaan Expedition. So uh, if uh, uh, 
a portion of the of the proceeds of this activity will go to uh, environmental protection. So 1,500 per person uh, will go to our efforts in uh, protecting the environment. And also uh, sustainable tourism development fee will also work on uh, putting up uh, soft, low impact, low, uh, low impact uh, infrastructure in the islands uh, to promote sustainable tourism activities. So uh, we have, we still have a lot to work on for tourism in the West Philippine Sea, but uh, we believe that uh, uh, we are we are on the right track as uh, most of uh, the major stakeholders right now are working in protecting the environment and pushing ecotourism in the West Philippine Sea. So uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ken. I think after your presentation, a lot of people here are convinced to join that expedition. I guess like the only comment I have on pricing, it's a, it's a very fair pricing and not really enough profit, right? Like people here were saying, um, baba <laughs> not so much, um, not enough proceeds for, for your group to organize this. But, um, but I think this is really a great start to tourism in the Pag-asa Islands and in, a, in the West Philippine Sea. Our next speaker, is Dr. Deo Florence Onda. Dr. Onda is an Associate Professor and Deputy Director for Research at the Marine Science Institute of the University of the Philippines. Some of his research projects and collaborations include being Project Leader of the Biodiversity in the West Philippine Sea under the National Security Council from March 2020 to March 2021 and being program leader and chief scientist in predicting responses between ocean transport and ecological connectivity of threatened ecosystems in the West Philippine Sea. Uh, I think it's very timely that Dr. Carmen and Mr. Ken Hupanda were showing us images of Pagasal Island because Dr. Onda wanted to join us in person, but he is currently on a marine expedition in the Pag-asa Islands. So joining us via a video, uh, video uh, talk Hi. is, oh, is Dr. Onda here? Okay, so via video call is Dr. Onda live from the Pag-asa Islands. Hi, Karen. Good morning. And thank you for that uh, very generous introduction. And again, I'd like to thank the organizers and I apologize if I cannot be physically with you right now. So I am joining you from Pag-asa Island, actually from the Pag-asa Island Research Station where we're conducting the summer expeditions of the Marine Science Institute. And actually with me right now is Dr. Villano <laughs> and the other researchers. Um, if you're probably wondering where I am, this is the Pag-asa Island Research Station, probably uh, a sneak peek. It's an igloo-shaped uh, uh, research station and the only marine scientific research station we have in the westernmost uh, territory of the country, which is in Pag-asa, in the Kalayaan Island Group. Um, for the benefit of everyone and also because of the intermittent connection that we have, thank you to Starlink and talk to, to, to Dr. Villanoy. Um, I already recorded the presentation, which talks about possible frameworks that we can use in coming up with intervention and mitigation as well as management strategies for the different habitats and connectivity, considering the connectivity of the different ecosystems that we have in the West Philippine Sea. So I think I'd like to ask the Secretariat if you can please uh, share the video presentation and I will just be waiting for questions later if there are any. Again, uh, thank you everyone and uh, greeting, uh, greeting you from the from Pag-asa Island in Kalayaan Island Group. Maraming salamat. Uh, Christina or the Secretariat, please. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you again for the invitation to share to you my thoughts on how we can help protect the resources, resources that, that we have, have in the West Philippine Sea. So the title, title of this presentation is Green to Blue, to Blue, Blue Frameworks, Frameworks in Protecting the West Philippine Sea. Sea. And I'm actually delivering this talk from Pagas Island, Island in, in Kalaya and Island Group in the West Philippines. So, so the, when, we when we talk, talk about, about protection, we need to understand that, that Ecosystems and, and habitats are, are not separated. separated. In, the, in context the context of the Philippines, this is important because the, the regions would always have an effect on the status of the regions. That's the, the green, green to blue. blue. And, and then, then that, that the, the environments that we have, have on the coast, coast are all, all connected to the environments that we have in the open ocean. ocean. And that's coast, coast to sea. And, and then, then the seas, seas in the Philippines are not, not isolated with other environments within the South China Sea that are, are probably, probably belong, belong to other countries, countries and that, that is seas to seas. seas. So, so this, this is important to understand because the, 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 the base framework will help, help us uh, be guided, guided on, on the scale, scale of intervention and the, and the type of interventions we can, can actually implement. Um, um, there, there will be some, some interventions and issues, issues that can only be managed at the local to national, national scale, scale and, and that there are certain environmental issues that should be managed at the regional or international scale. For example, For example, when we talk about coast to coast, the, the mangrove forests are, are not isolated from, from the sea grass, which, is, which are, are just parallel to this environment. And then and the, the sea grasses are also connected, connected to coral reefs. And, and that the coral reefs and all, all of these coastal, coastal environments have, have contributions on, on the productivity of, of the pelagic waters, waters or, or the open, open ocean, ocean environment. When, when we talk, talk about CCCs, for example, example this model shows, shows you the particle dispersal, dispersal the, the dispersion of particle, particle coming from Kalayan and group, group, for example, for example the, the particle, particle being a, a, an, an egg, egg or a larvae, larvae of coral, coral that, that drifts with, with the current uh, blown, blown by the wind, wind and, and then being, being transported, transported in the different coastal, coastal environments of the West, West Philippine Sea. So, so this, this, this just shows us that, that the, the environments, environments that we have in KIG are not, are not isolated from the other coastal, coastal environments around, around the South, South China Sea basin, the, the different littoral states in, in the South, South China, China Sea. So, so there, there is really a strong connectivity between seas within the South China Sea. Um, this, this is uh, uh, true, true for the fact, fact because, because of the fact, fact that fishes don't, fish don't have passports, passports they, they don't stay, stay in one area. area. For, for example, they, they might, might actually lay their, their eggs in one reef, in one in one reef, reef but, but those, those eggs, eggs are passive drifters, drifters, drifters so, so they will drift with, with the current, and, and as, as they, they develop, develop, they will mature, and, and at a certain point in time, they need to find another reef where they will settle down and get to apply. So you have this very, very important, important source and same dynamics happening, happening in, in the different and among environments, environments and habitats, habitats in the South, South China Sea. West, West Philippines. Philippines. In, in the, the studies that we've done in MSI with our colleagues, they've shown that the West, West Philippine Sea is actually an important habitat, habitat for both, uh, both, both for settling or sink and release or source, source of larvae and, and eggs of the different uh, important species and keystone species in the region. So, so this, this framework should always be should, should always, always be considered in coming up with management strategies as well as, well as protection interventions in, in the West, West Philippine Sea, South, South China Sea. However, However it's, it's not all good, good in paradise. paradise. <laughs> we, we know, know that, that the West Philippine Sea and, and the other environments around the South China Sea are, are actually um, facing, facing threats. threats. And, and they are already experiencing degradation because, because of the different human, human and um, Human, human activities and also, also pollution. pollution. Um, in the, in the Philippines, Philippines, for example, the threat of overfishing as well as destructive fishing as well have been, been uh, contributing, contributing significantly to the decline of the status, status of the health of the different reefs around the, the country, country, as well as, well as the, the which, which, which would then actually have, have an effect on the fisher stocks and purity. Um, studies, studies have shown, shown the, the significant decline in the fisheries fish production, production of the country. country. For, For example, example, in the 90s, 2000, the West, West Philippine Sea has been, been reported to contribute to around 20% to, uh, of, of the, the national, national fisheries fish production. production. But, but in 2018, it only contributed to around 2% as, far, as, as per before, before. Yeah, yeah, to, to, not, to, not, to the national fisheries fish production. Now we need to ask the question. What, what could have, have caused, caused the decline in the fisheries? fisheries? Is it because, because there is already less fish, fish to fish? Um, um, is, is it because, because the environments where they are supposed, supposed to multiply, multiply and live and thrive are already, already degrading? degrading? 
is someone else getting, getting the fish that, that, that Filipino, Filipino fishermen, fishermen should actually be, uh, be getting? getting is, is climate change already affecting, affecting the, behavior the behavior as well as, as the ecophysiology of the fish that, that we have? have. So, so though, there, there are, are different factors, factors that we need to consider and understand. It's really pinpoint really what, what are, are the issues, the root causes of the problem, and the possible interventions and mitigations strategies that we can implement. Aside, Aside from, from these traditional, traditional, you know, um, threats, threats, we, we also, also know, know that the, in, the intrusion as well as, well as the activities of other countries in the South China Sea, for example, China, China well-documented well activities have also contributed to the decline in the in the health and the status of the environments that we have in the West Philippine Sea because of poaching and illegal harvesting activities overfishing and illegal practices, even the artificial island building which decimate and actually kill an entire reef ecosystem, uh, affecting the source and sink dynamics probably of the different reefs in the South China Sea, and also the conduct of uh, unregulated marine scientific research activities. Um, we have also seen an increase in the threat uh, caused by plastics, for example, in the West Philippine Sea and the South China Sea. Our expeditions in the area have shown accumulation of the different ma marine debris in the isolated islands, you know, such as in, Pag uh, in Kota Island, in Laok Island, and other inhabited islands such as Taipei, Pag-asa. There's also the threat of uh, climate change. The West Philippine Sea, in the context of a changing world, the increasing global temperature, uh, uh, which could actually you know, uh, affect the behavior, uh, ecophysiology, um, the extent of proliferation as well as growth of the different species would always have an effect on the ecosystem. So all of these threats can actually be um, classified or categorized as those that are continuing, non-traditional threats, and also the new and emerging uh, threats in the environment. But this continuing as well as new and emerging could also have different scales of interventions. For example, uh, overfishing, illegal fishing activities, poaching, and even oil spills, um, harvesting can actually be dealt with by local and national policies. And most for, for most of this, we already have regulatory uh, bodies as well as mechanisms on how to prevent this from happening. But you also have this new and emerging which we still don't have policies for. For example, um, sewage disposal in the in the open waters of the Kalayan Island group uh, or ocean-based uh, plastics pollution coming from vessels as well as conduct of illegal marine scientific research activities. And then you have the climate change as well as the spread of infectious diseases. So this can actually be dealt with or at least the interventions may actually be designed or at the regional scale. And it is still important to, you know, despite all of these uh, threats already happening in the West Philippine Sea, I think it is also important to emphasize that many of the environments in the West Philippine Sea are still productive. They are still alive. And thus, they still need to be protected. For example, this is a Yungin Shoal. A Yungin Shoal has been, you know, um, uh, a hot spot for uh, the tension uh, that is happening, or the geopolitical tension that is happening in the West Philippine Sea. But our studies in collaboration, for example, with uh, the Philippine Space Agency showed how productive the Ayungin Shoal is. If you dive there, the reefs are still good, in good condition. Um, there's really an abundance of different fishes. Uh, there's an abundance of diversity. So, and the, these shoals, um, including the Ayungin Shoal, are still contributing to the productivity of the West Philippine Sea and the South China Sea in general. So it is important to, to emphasize that they are still alive and thus need um, Environmental protection, however, should be emphasized that it is a shared problem. But aside from being a problem, it is also actually an opportunity. We need, we know that the geopolitical tension has inhibited several initiatives from being implemented in the region. But uh, we also need to acknowledge that in order to protect the West Philippine Sea, we need to understand how it actually works. And by understanding that, we can come up with sustainable, long-term, appropriate 
um, management schemes and strategies to actually protect and intervene in its degradation. And one way to understand this is to conduct marine scientific research. And I would like to uh, dedicate a few slides on MSR being an untapped, probably, and an underappreciated mechanism on how we can um, enjoin other countries to go back to the negotiation table and talk about environmental protection in the South China Sea region. MSR has been uh, is being pushed in the South China Sea as a non-aggressive intervention for conflict resolution since the 90s as a form of science diplomacy. And the Philippines is in a very opportune time right now because we have started rebuilding our MSR capacity. We actually have started enhancing our uh, infrastructures as well as uh, assets in order to uh, further strengthen our MSR capability. So now we have started establishing the Marine Scientific uh, Research Framework as well as the National Academic Research Field. And we already have a master plan for this from 2020 to 2030. So part of this plan is to build a fleet dedicated to scientific research in the Philippines. If you go to the U.S., there are several research vessels dedicated to MSR or scientific endeavors that are being managed by universities. But they are, but they work as a consortium. So it's a similar organizational structure in the Philippines. Um, the initial assets will be deployed to UPMSI and then Bicol University for the Eastern Philippines, uh, UP uh, Visayas for uh, the Central Region, as well as uh, MSUIIT or Iligan Institute of Technology for Bohol Sea, Sulu Sea, and then the Celebes Sea. And then, of course, MSI dedicating most of its assets to the West Philippine Sea and Archipelagic Seas of the Philippines. Now, it is also important to acknowledge that it is only not the Philippines that has the uh, the assets to do marine scientific research. So, if we can invite other uh, research vessels in the region to actually conduct joint ocean marine scientific research activity or even concerted MSR activities in each of the territories, then we can share data. And from there, we can share expertise. And then hopefully through that exercise, we can actually um, encourage confidence building. Um, confidence building is important so that we can all be confident with each other, uh, trust each other, and then uh, start really talking on how we can move forward in protecting the um, environments that we have in the Philippine Sea. There is already a template for this. The Philippines has been working with Vietnam for the past decades doing JOMSTRE or Joint Ocean Marine Scientific Research Expeditions, which has led to several uh, publications and then basis actually of coming up with their own marine protected areas in their own uh, waters. The idea now is hopefully to expand the Joint Ocean uh, MSR Expeditions. And uh, Vietnam and the Philippines in 2021 has started uh, uh, has restarted uh, the, op the the pipeline to um, relaunch uh, the phase two of Jojomstre. So there is already a template for this, and hopefully this can be other countries. Um, the Philippines has also already launched a new station in the West Philippine Sea called the Pagasa Island Research Station. Actually, it's more of a relaunch of station of a station that we already had in the 90s. But it Piers or uh, Pagasa Island Research Station is not the only research station in the West Philipp in the South China Sea. So if we can again invite the other research stations to network with each other, share data, and actually do concerted efforts, you know, concerted or uh, joint research uh, activities, then we can come up with an, a deeper understanding of what is really happening in the region. And then from understanding, can come, we can come up with a more regional, wider uh, and more appropriate management schemes. Uh, we can do, for example, long-term monitoring work for climate change studies, plastics monitoring, migration, and connectivity studies. Um, it, it is, however, important to emphasize that although we have started building these capacities, we still need to invest more to science and research and development, especially in the West Philippine Sea. This just shows you, for example, the um, comparison of the assets of UK with the Philippines, you know, with the Philippines actually uh, having longer... Uh, in more islands and longer coastlines, but we have less assets to do MSR. 
And at the end of the day, we also need stab- to establish a network of people. Because at the end of the day, it will always be people-to-people relations. It will always be scientists to yeah, scientists working with each other, or policymakers to policymakers and decision makers working with each other. So we really need to expand people-to-people network. Uh, the uh, there is still no South China Sea Scientific Regional Conference, and probably this is one way on how Philippines can lead the initiative, uh, can lead the the effort to actually invite other countries. You know, to share what they already know and short, share common uh, best practices and also the issues that we are all facing and come up with a region-wide um, solution or activity or intervention for this issue. So science-based discussion and results in the South China Sea. The other challenges I think that the Philippines still need to work on in order to sustain these efforts is that we need to acknowledge that there are still lacking policies and a structural framework in the Philippines to support marine scientific research. There's a need for long-term marine scientific research and even research and development framework and roadmap in the West Philippine Sea, which we still don't have up to this moment. MSI crafted a 15-year R&D plan, but it has not yet been integrated with the other agenda or roadmaps of the other agencies. So there's a, really, there's a need to put everything in one page. There is still no dedicated agency or office for marine scientific research activity plans. Although CONMIRA under the National Coast Watch Council has been um, assisting in the coordination, it is limited in the coordination and the conduct of MSR itself. But there is no agency that focuses in expanding, in developing, and assisting and facilitating uh, the crafting of an MSR framework for the country. There is still a need for marine science policy framework. Although we have the closest to this are the NAST's Pagtanao 2050, which includes discussions on the blue economy and the marine policy also led by the National Coast Watch Council. There's still a need really for a marine science policy, which can also be embedded in the MSR framework of the country. And again, the UPMSI is still they still believes, and we are still pushing for um, the establishment of a Department of Fisheries and Oceans. 82% of the Philippines is actually underwater. It is marine, and therefore, uh, it in itself deserves an entire agency that will take care of the resources that we have in the blue waters of the country. So with that, I thank you. Um, um, there's a lot of opportunities for everyone to contribute to the protection of the West Philippine Sea, and not just the West Philippine Sea, but the marine environment in the Philippines. And with that, I'm leaving you with this quote from the MSI founding director, uh, Dr. Ed Gomez. Maraming salamat po at magandang umaga. Secretary for Maritime and Oceans Affairs. Um, so I'm joined here by Director Bob Kintin. We found out last night that uh, Asik Ange is not feeling well, so I'm delivering um, her presentation. She was the head of the Philippine delegation to the negotiations of the BBNJ. So it would have been perfect if it was her, but um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I've been given 10 to 15 minutes for this session, implications of implications of environmental initiatives and maritime foreign policy. So I will attempt to provide insights on this topic with a focus on the new High Seas Treaty or the international legally binding instrument on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So a typical UN sense, it's a very long title. Um, or the BBNJ agreement, which the Secretary of Foreign Affairs calls barbecue in New Jersey. <laughs> 
So as you know, as we all know, the Philippines is a maritime and archipelagic state. It's inextricably linked to the seas and the oceans. Our seas and the resources surrounding our more than 7,000 islands have served as the lifeblood of Filipino communities throughout history of our nation. These waters remain crucial to the movement of people, cargo, and cargo across islands and regions, vibrant fishing, shipping, shipbuilding, tourism, and related industries, effective and efficient delivery of government services throughout the country. Uh, the map shows the vastness of the oceans, comprising 70% of the world's surface, as well as showing the vessel traffic density. So that's the orange lines. Um, today, 80% of the world's goods are transported by the sea. The Philippines, encircled in red, is located in one of the busiest maritime routes in the world, with thousands of ships passing through our waters. We can also visualize the challenge of being an archipelagic Ar 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 archipelago with porous borders patrolling vast oceans with water against internal and external threats. As a member of the international community and in to ensure our sa the safety of our vessels and our seafarers, the Philippines joined the IMO, a specialized agency of the UN responsible for measures to improve the safety and security of international shipping and prevent marine pollution. So the Philippines remains the world's biggest supplier of seafarers and officers. Uh, and the third pillar of foreign policy is protection of Filipinos overseas. So this is the clear interest of the DFA in this. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The Philippines is considered one of the global centers of marine biodiversity. We are located in what is known as the Coral Triangle, as I expressed earlier by uh, our earlier speakers. Um, as you can see on the map, portions of the waters of the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Timor-Leste, Papua New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands um, comprise the Coral Triangle. Um, other photos on the slide show Benham Bank, uh, the shallowest point of the Philippine rise and various corals and marine species found in Tubataha. The Philippines recognizes the importance of marine diversity and has implemented several measures to protect and conserve marine environment. However, due to the fluid nature of water and most especially the species, Marine ecosystems have transboundary pro properties, and the water and marine species cross boundaries in national jurisdictions. So these are the initiatives, the regimes, the international law regimes that we have joined. Um, obviously, UNCLOS, the IMO conventions, MARPOL, um, the Convention on Biological Diversity, CBT, the Nagoya Protocol on Access on Genetic Resources, and the Fair and Equitable Sharing of Benefits Arising from Their Utilization in the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Um, UNCLOS, even the expansion of the maritime zones up to 200 nautical miles, the rights and obligations of states regarding the use of oceans, their resources, and the protection of marine and coastal environment aren't fully set out especially in the high seas and areas beyond national jurisdictions. So, yeah, it's so in 2015, the UN, the United Nations member states adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So the 2030 Agenda with 17 goals and 169 targets. And the date of reckoning for this is in 2030, so seven years from now. Um, it's a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, improve the lives and prospects for everyone everywhere. It sets out a 15-year goal, so we're at the halfway point uh, to achieve these goals. So as you can see, um, <clears throat> seven, seven targets, three means of implementation. Um, okay. So in this map, uh, dark blue are the A, B, and J, areas beyond national jurisdiction. So you can see it's a larger space. Uh, most of it is unknown. It constitutes over 90% of the habitable space on the planet and contains some 250,000 known species, with many more remaining to be discovered. Nearly two-thirds of the ocean, along, the unique, along with its unique species and ecosystems, are in areas beyond national jurisdiction. However, fragmented legal frameworks have left biodiversity in ABNJ vulnerable to growing threats, including climate change, pollution, plastic pollution, overfishing, habitat destruction, ocean acidification, and underwater noise. And of course, this map shows the infamous nine dash line, claim of China, as well as the exclusive economic zones of the littoral states as guaranteed by UNCLOS. 
Um, of course, one line has measurable coordinates and the projection of baselines demarcating entitlements and the other is a representation of a claim with indeterminate coordinates. So even this representation here is a guess at best. Notice the core, of course, the high seas pocket in the middle of the adjacent EEZs, and that's the area that would be covered by the BBNJ. Um, you may recall that by notification and statement of claim on January 22, 2013, the Philippines initiated arbitral proceedings against China pursuant to Articles 286 and 287 of the UNCLOS, with Article 1 of Annex 7 of the Convention. In its filing, the Philippines stressed that it did not seek in this arbitration a determination of which party enjoys sovereignty over the islands claimed by both, nor did it request the delimitation of any maritime boundaries. Um, so the jump main slide. It's fine. Um, so there's no need to go through what the arbitral award decided, apart than to say that the nine dash line is without lawful effect to the extent that they exceed the geographic and substantive limits of China's maritime entitlements under UN clause. This is slide 10, yeah. Um, as the conservation and sustainable use of mar marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction had increasingly attracted international attention due in no small part to the development of technological tools that made deep sea exploration possible. So back in 1982, it wasn't really foreseen that there would be a lot of debate, perhaps because the technology wasn't there yet. Um, but th that's where we are now. Um, the member states decided to convene the IGC, the Intergovernmental Conference, to elaborate the text of an internationally legally binding instrument under UNCLOS on the conservation and sustainable use of the BBNJ, with a view to developing an instrument as soon as possible. So the Philippines participated in this process. Um, ASIC Ange Ponce was a junior officer in New York when this process started, and she ended as the head of delegation. So that's how long it takes. Um, the, uh, the IGC. Uh, The negotiations uh, for the Philippine delegation, we had to push our interests, uh, considering interconnectedness of the marine ecosystem and our dependence on these. So, keep on this slide first. Uh, sorry, 11. Uh, so, in its resolution, 24 December 2017, uh, created the preparatory committee on the res. Uh, on UNCLOS, uh, on BBNJ, with a view to developing the instrument. Okay, next slide. Okay, in 2011, member states agreed to the following package. So there are four, uh, one, two, three, four, five thematic areas. Uh, marine genetic resources, MS, MGRs, including questions on the sharing of benefits. Measures such as area-based management tools, ABMT, including marine protected areas environmental impact assessments, capacity building and transfer of marine technology, CBT, MT. Lastly, there are also cross-cutting issues such as institutional mechanisms and dispute settlement procedures. Next. Okay, so these are the contentious issues which took a lot of time to negotiate. In the case of MGRs, for example, the mechanism on access and benefit sharing proved to be one of the most challenging parts of the agreement. Um, in the end, it was agreed that such benefits from the utilization of MGRs and digital sequence information shall be shared fairly and equitably for the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity of ABNJ. It should be noted that digital sequence information generated disagreements throughout all the sessions of the BBNJ negotiations and has also been controversial in the Convention on Biodiversity. The carving out of disputed areas from the application of uh, area-based management tools was also a major point of, point of debate. In the end, it was agreed that the establishment of area-based management tools shall not include any areas within national jurisdictions and be utilized as a basis for asserting or denying any claims to sovereignty, sovereign rights, or jurisdiction, including in respect of any disputes. Proposals for the establishment of such area-based management tools will not be considered by the conference of parties and will likewise not be interpreted as recognition or non-recognition of any claims to sovereignty, sovereign rights, and jurisdiction. And the threshold for the conduct of EIAs generated debate. The, co uh, the compromise was a tiered approach 
where a screening of the activity shall be conducted when a planned activity may have more than a minor or transitory effect. So the vagueness of the language kind of demonstrates why there's a lot of debate. On the marine environment or the effects of the activity are unknown or poorly understood, followed by UNCLOS, by the UNCLOS threshold, uh, meaning reasonable grounds for believing that the planned activity may cause substantial pollution of or significant and harmful changes to the marine environment for conducting EIA. So this will clearly be elaborated further. Um, there are only some, these are only some of the issues which illustrate how certain parts of the agreement were highly contested and also required the highest degree of discernment on the part of negotiators. And on the part of the Philippine delegation, I think a lot of flexibility. <laughs> Uh, slide for, next slide, please. So for the Philippines, the following principles in the agreement were key. The instrument must be anchored on the common heritage of mankind. So common heritage of mankind is a general concept of international law that some areas belong to all humanity and that their resources are available to everyone's use and benefit, taking into account future generations and the needs of developing countries. So the next is... It must give due regard to the rights and jurisdiction of adjacent coastal states. So the principle of due regard is also an area where um, there's a lot of vagueness. Um, special recognition must be accorded to archipelagic states like the Philippines. Um, it must incorporate the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle indicates the lack of scientific certainty is no reason to postpone action to avoid potentially serious or irreversible harm to the environment. It advocates the use of precaution in situations where some scientific uncertainty exists. And finally, it must be imbued with transparency. So more or less uh, for the Philippines, uh, we were able to retain these elements in the final text of the negotiations. But of course, it required a lot of compromise. And uh, Yusek Drus will be in a position to, s to say more about that. The resumed IGC was held uh, in February 20 until March 4, 2023, at the UN headquarters after two weeks. Ayan. Two weeks and 36 hours of negotiation. I think 36 hours doesn't uh, include the suspended time, no? Because they stopped the clock at a certain point. Because um, otherwise, the delegations would lose their authority to participate in the meeting, so they had to stop the clock. Um, and uh, we already got uh, on Saturday the translation, so official. So we'll be circulating that with the members of the Philippine delegation. Again. Next. Okay, so these are some of the challenges we expect the agreement to face when it enters into force. Um, in the case of the MGRs, particularly equitable sharing of the non-monetary and monetary benefits derived from marine genetic resources. Developing countries do not have access to the technologies and finances to study marine organisms in the ABNJ, whose information can be utilized for commercial purposes. While the agreement offers a guarantee through the access and benefit sharing mechanism, it would be interesting to see how this would actually be applied. Another is the designation of MPAs. MPAs being restrictive in nature, it would be interesting to see how, much, how such measures under the BBNJ will be implemented, keeping in mind that other international frameworks and bodies, like the IMO, also have the facility to establish MPAs. Uh, at the same time, EIAs. Um, as the determination under the agreement that EIAs are necessary for activities in the BBNJ are state-led and under UNCLOS thresholds, the call-in mechanism is now a tool for vigilance of states who may potentially be affected by adverse impacts and or those who have reason to believe that an activity may have negative impacts on the ABNJ. Even so, it remains to be seen how effective this mechanism would be to stop potentially harmful activities from being commenced or to halt such activities after a recommendation to this effect. These are only a few of the growing pains that we foresee the, um, on the BBNJ as it enter, oh, when it enters into force. Nonetheless, the, AB, the BBNJ agreement, as it is now and with its institutional mechanisms, is a significant advance in the international community's efforts towards conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Next. Yeah. 
To sum up, the BBNJ agreement can be a means to close critical governance gaps by enabling the establishment of a high seas MPAs and associated management measures. The BBNJ can also provide a strong overall policy framework and act as a central authority in efficiently coordinating an international approach to ocean management. At the moment, there is no mechanism or process by which comprehensive marine protected areas can be established at an international level. Uh, therefore, the new High Seas Treaty fills this gap by enabling the establishment of High Seas MPAs and associated management measures so that the global community can finally protect the ocean at the level recommended by scientists for the benefit of the ocean and humankind. With this new instrument, we have reason to be optimistic that the conservation and sustainable use goals and environmental protection objectives which the international community has set will be within reach and can be achieved, if not within our lifetime, then in the next generation maybe. Uh, with that, I end the presentation of Asik Ponce. And uh, we'll, if we don't, we're not able to answer the questions between me and Bob, we'll take them back to her and share it with the organization. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deputy Assistant Secretary Maningat. And finally, for our last speaker today, we have someone from the National Security Council. Assistant Director General Jonathan Malaya joined the National Security Council as the Assistant Director General in March 2023. During the Duterte administration, he was the Undersecretary for Plans, Public Affairs and Communications Spokesperson of the Department of Interior and Local Government. Previously, he was the DILG's Assistant Secretary for Communications and Public Affairs and the Administrator of the Department's Federalism and Constitutional Reform Program. Joining us to present his discussion on civil maritime cooperation in national security Let's all welcome our final speaker for today, Director, Assistant Director Gen General Jonathan Malaya. Thank you very much, Karen. And I'd like to begin by uh, thanking the ADRI and the Strat Base for your kind invitation to the National Security Council for us to join this forum. Siguro by now, information overload na kayo. Uh, but I'll try to add more to that information overload. Okay. So the topic given to me is really civil maritime cooperation. And technically, this is a new concept in the Philippines. No? Um, when we did our research, um, it's uh, very new because the uh, concept is really come from Australia. No? Um, Australia defines uh, CMS as advancing and protecting Australia's interests by actively managing non-military risk to Australia and Australia's maritime domain. So, nag-research, research pa po tayo dito bago natin to ginawa itong presentation na ito. But the uh, context of civil maritime security in Australia is also covered by the Philippines' concept of maritime arrangements no, or maritime security. In fact, if you look at the um, national marine policy, of the Philippines issued on November 8, 1994, um, the definition of Australia and the Philippines would somehow be the same because under the national marine policy, um, the term maritime security is a state in which the country's marine assets, marine practices, territorial integrity, and coastal peace and order are protected, conserved, preserved, and enhanced. Now, there are also other documents in our, um, uh, in our jurisdiction wherein we can see also the concept of civil maritime cooperation. And I'd like to bring your attention, of course, to the national security policy and the national security strategy. No? And incidentally, dagdag ko lang, uh, we are now almost done with the national security policy under this administration. We in the national in the end in the National Security Council have already completed it, and we have sent it to all government agencies, including the FA, including the DA, for your comments and uh, suggestions, so we can improve it before we can send it to the president. No. 
but um, we also are looking at doing public consultations about the national security policy before we get to adopt it. So we're looking at partnering with institutions, academic institutions, so that we can have a vigorous discussion of the country's national security policy moving forward. So if we look at the national security policy of the Philippines, it clearly defines there our policy in so far as um, uh, for instance, the NSP recognizes the Philippines' extensive maritime interest as an archipelagic state. We're in, uh, we aim to enhance cooperative maritime security and defense arrangements with other countries in order to safeguard the territorial integrity and sovereignty of the country. In fact, in the new NSP, the one I just mentioned a few minutes ago, maritime and airspace security is one of our 12-point national security interests or national security agenda with particular focus, of course, on all of the things that need to be protected to ensure the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the Philippines. All right, so given that context, and for us to fully develop our um, cap capabilities as a nation, the Philippine government is currently undertaking a reassessment of our maritime governance structure. Uh, Secretary Eduardo Año would like us to adopt a new governance structure moving forward to deal with maritime security challenges. And this is what is called as the 360 degree archipelagic governance approach. Okay, so this um, uh, governance structure or the 360 archipelagic governance structure takes into consideration all of the existing gaps in our governance structure and we are calibrating these gaps in the context of the current VUCAD environment. No? It, usong -uso ito ngayon, itong word na VUCAD. No? Um, we are apparently facing a VUCAD future, a volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, and dynamic no, environment. Therefore, to address that concern, the 360 degree archipelagic governance structure has two dimensions. Okay. The first is the hard security component, no, which covers territorial defense, maritime law enforcement, border security, marine protection, and the like. And the second component is the bl blue economy component, which was uh, discussed extensively by the other speakers about how to, we are going to protect our maritime environment, wherein we call an attention and prioritization on maritime commons in building national development. Now, if we look at maritime, civil maritime cooperation, or what in the Philippine context is called maritime security cooperation, we need to look into two critical areas of cooperation. The first is the national level, and the second is the international level. And on the national level, this, is, uh, this requires a whole of society, whole of government strategy to align the mandates of the different government agencies and identifying areas for interagency cooperation and collaboration. For, in, for instance, we need to implement a clear and cohesive, consistent foreign policy, especially with regard to the West Philippine Sea. And the National Task Force West Philippine Sea, chaired by the National Security Council, uh, Secretary Eduardo Año, is now in the process of developing a clear and coherent national strategy for the West Philippine Sea. And I'm sure DASNOC will be there, as always. Uh, to represent the Department of Foreign Affairs in the workshops that are going to be held this week, oh, sorry, in this month for that purpose. No. On the international level, we must harness the strengths of our partners, our strategic like-minded partners in the region to our, to our advantage for further capacity building measures like joint exercises, diversified cooperation that would bring the country closer to being a capable maritime nation. And there are already many engagements in this regard, and some of them are shown on the slide. For example, in terms of the Philippine-US cooperation, 
as a way of strengthening our alliance with the United States, the Philippines and the United States have agreed on a maritime security framework or a Bandai, Bantay Dagat Framework on May 23, 2022. This was signed in Hawaii, Camp Smith, Hawaii. And Bandai Dagat, as we all know, uh, Guardian of the Sea, it illustrates the Philippines and the United States resolve to improve maritime domain awareness and confront maritime challenges together. This approach is designed to enable a holistic approach to maritime security through the interoperability, masyadong sikat yung word na ngayon, interoperability no? of U.S. and Philippine forces and the option to include interagency operations. The second engagement is, of course, with Australia. Through the Philippine Civil Maritime Security Program, this aims to support the Philippines to strengthen our maritime security. And the governments of the Philippines and Australia have expanded their engagement focused on maritime governance systems, processes, and interagency coordination, maritime natural resources management protection, technical assistance, research, and workshops. So it is a pretty elaborate agreement between us and Australia. We are now also engaged in current discussions centered on different areas, including the protection of coral and marine resources, and mapping out some of the key areas of importance uh, to our country in the West Philippine Sea. Besides our cooperation with the US and Australia, we also have our partnership with Japan. The governments of the Philippines and Japan have reaffirmed their efforts to reinforce marine domain awareness and maritime law enforcement based on international law in particular, the UNCLOS for the stability of the South China Sea, the Sulu Celebes Sea, and their surrounding areas. Uh, President Marcos has welcomed Japan's support to the Coast Guard by way of implementing the 2017 MO MOC, or Memorandum of Cooperation on Coast Guard Affairs. And he has, in fact, thanked Japan for the training and scholarship of our Coast Guard personnel and staff-to-staff -staff programs by the Japan Coast Guard and the continued dispatch of JICA experts to the Philippines. No? Uh, President Marcos and the uh, Japanese Prime Minister have, con have committed to strengthen knowledge transfer and sharing of Japan's best, best practices through the SAFIRE in collaboration with the U.S. Coast Guard. The President also expressed satisfaction with concrete projects for the enhancement of marine law enforcement capabilities and we are looking at developing a uh, Coast Guard Subic Bay support base, which would in the future serve as the home of uh, 97 meter class patrol vessels and the installation of a satellite communication system on patrol vessels. Both countries have also affirmed the importance of regular bilateral arrangements to the maritime di dialogue. So our um, our cooperation agreement with uh, the Japanese government is also ex ex as extensive as the ones we have with Australia and the United States. All right. And then we also have the collaboration with the European Union. Just recently on uh, March 20 to 21, 11 maritime agencies met in Manila and agreed to create a national IORIS government structure to best serve the operational interests of the Philippines. IORIS being a neutral and secure information exchange and maritime coordination platform serving the needs of national agencies across the Indo-Pacific region. Once established, because this is a uh, relatively new arrangement, once established, the structure would allow the Philippines to be integrated into the wider IORIS community being developed to address maritime challenges with the twofold objectives. To bring, to facilitate, enhance exchange of information with regional partners while ensuring for the long-term implementation and sustainability of the program. Therefore, if the Philippines is going to um, strengthen its maritime security cooperation, it should be done on two levels. 
on the level of the national, wherein all of the government agencies are aligned and consistent, and we have a, and we have a clear and focused uh, policy on the West Philippine Sea. That solves the national level. And on the international level, we work with our traditional allies and partners across the region to also further Philippine national interest and ensure the territorial integrity and sovereignty of the Republic of the Philippines. So with that, again, thank you very much to ADR Institute and for all for your kind attention. Maraming salamat po. Thank you so much, Assistant Director General Jonathan Malaya. And now we'll be open the forum. We'll be opening the forum for questions. And in the interest of time, we'll be limiting the Q&A to 10 minutes. So I encourage the audience to please ask your questions. Uh, you can direct the questions to anyone from our panel of speakers. Anyone have any questions? Okay. Yes, sir, please. We have a microphone there in the back. Uh, first question is for uh, Assistant Director General, uh, Jonathan Malaya. Uh, my name is Barnaby, sorry. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Barnaby from Al Jazeera. Um, you've, of course, addressed the statement or the speech of the Chinese ambassador last Friday via uh, a written statement, um, some interviews as well over the weekend. But over the weekend as well, Senator Risa Ontiveros called for the expulsion of the Chinese ambassador. Is that something that the Philippine government uh, is willing to do? Okay. May I refer that question to the Department of Foreign Affairs? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think the, the statement of uh, Senator Risa Ontiveros is a personal statement in her capacity as the uh, senator of the Republic of the Philippines. You know, our senators, of course, can express their opinions on any matter, but it does not reflect, at the moment, the uh, position of the National Security Council. Okay, so just just to be clear, the position of the National Security Council on on that particular statement of the Chinese ambassador is. Well, we've made our well, we've made our position very clear. Uh, in fact, prior to the statement of. Um, Ambassador Wang at the, at the Manila Forum, the ambassador went to the National Security Council on a call. And during that call, the issue of the Taiwan was also raised. And we specifically told uh, the Chinese ambassador that the Philippines has no intention or, or, or whatever uh, to interfere in the Taiwan question. We are consistent with the policy of the Philippine government. We observe the One China policy, and therefore there is no possibility of the Philippines uh, ever interfering in the Taiwan question. That is why when he spoke at the Manila Forum on Friday, we were surprised by the statements that were made. So to further clarify uh, the position of the NSC, we reiterated uh, that position in a statement over the weekend. Assistant Director General, someone asked what was the statement for those who were not able to follow the news. The statement of the NSC. The statement of the NSC? <laughs> well, the statement of the NSC was uh, pretty clear. Uh, number one, we are not in, we will not in any way interfere with the Taiwan question. It is a domestic and internal matter that concerns uh, the People's Republic of China and Taiwan. Okay, so we have no uh, uh, intention whatsoever. The second statement of the National Security Council is that we will not allow ourselves to be used by any external power for us to interfere in that, uh, in that issue. And thirdly, our primordial concern is the welfare and benefit of the 150,000 Filipinos who are working uh, in uh, Taiwan. Uh, therefore, um, we are, uh, has, 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 as has been the position of the Philippine government, we are for the peaceful resolution of the Taiwan question, number one. We are for protecting the interest, the national interest of the Philippines. And number three, what we are doing is to ensure the territorial integrity and sovereignty of the Philippines. Okay. Sir, if I may, just one more question for 
Sure. Okay. Wait, one last na to, ha? Last, one last, last question. There, there are also okay. other panelists Sorry. Uh, who, who made very good uh, presentations about protecting the West Philippine Sea, the marine resources in the West Philippine Sea. Right, okay. Sige. Sorry. Um, just on the Balikatan exercises, because the, there was an op-ed in the South China Morning Post uh, last Sunday as well, so, um, insinuating that the Philippines may now be taking sides in these geopolitical tensions in the region, given the size of Balikatan exercises this year? Okay. Um, our alliance with the United States is a very strong alliance. It is a 72-year-old alliance signed way, way back when we were not yet born. Okay? It is a, it is a clear, uh, uh, the United States is our treaty partner. And consistent with that treaty partner, we have signed numerous agreements with them. You know? That includes the conduct of the regular Balikatan exercises. That includes the uh, Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. That includes the Visiting Forces Agreement and many other agreements that we have signed with the United States. No? These agreements, when they were signed way, way back, they were not meant to contain any power. They were not meant to uh, limit, to contain, or to counter any, any power, as uh, some people may insinuate. They are for the protection of Philippine national interest and to pursue the national interests of the Republic of the Philippines. So uh, the Balikatan exercises, the additional EDCA sites, they are all consistent with the position of the Philippine government, which is number one, pursue the Philippine national interest. Number two, strengthen the capacity of the armed forces of the Philippines. The location of the EDCA sites are consistent with the basing plan of the armed forces. We chose those sites so that we can develop those bases for the purpose of strengthening the armed forces. And finally, the interest of the Philippines is to uh, ensure the territorial integrity of the Republic. So those uh, sites are for those purposes and not for purposes of taking sides or for countering or containing any other power in the region. Thank you. A question from uh, the lady. Hi, sir. Here. Hi, ma'am. Uh, to the panelists, thank you. My name is Karen Lemma. I am from Reuters News. Um, sorry, you said a question for you, but this is related to your presentation. Don't worry. <laughs> but I also have a question for you, Sek Bayate and Dr. Ablan. Sir, first of all, on the strategic cooperation you mentioned with the US, Australia, and Japan, um, the United States, our ambassador to the United States, um, Ambassador Modis mentioned that there were uh, discussions on a possible joint maritime patrol cooperation between and among the United States, Japan, and Australia. Definitely. Could we get an update on that, sir, if that's progressing? <laughs> and then I'll give my question to Dr. and Yusek after. Sir, thank the you. The FA. <laughs> <laughs> The, the talks are progressing, okay, but I am not at liberty right now to share um, how these are progressing you know, because they are uh, subject to more negotiations between the both countries. No, it's parang ano lang to eh, parang yung BB, BBMJ, <laughs> yes, parang BBMJ lang, mahaba habang proseso pa. No, but um, as I said, uh, it's uh, it's progressing right now. There are a lot of uh, issues and details that have to be resolved. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sir, but when you say it's progressing, that's you're referring to U.S., Japan, Australia talks, because yes. that was the, um, what the ambassador mentioned about the possible joint, but okay, so that's progressing. Yes. All right. Do we expect any, I know you said any particular timeline when that might happen, and what would be the legal ground for that to actually happen? Then, siguro para mas madali, may I just refer you to the statement? in the 2 plus 2. Okay. Uh, there was a 2 plus 2 statement by the U.S. Uh, and the Philippine side, and the joint patrols was also mentioned there. So, ikatatapos lang noon. So, uh, I think that is the last official statement coming from uh, the Philippine government and the, the U.S. government with regards to the issue of joint patrols. Sir, salamat. Appreciate Thank you. It. Dr. Ablan and Yusek, Ma'am, um, Professor on the asked a lot of very valid questions during his presentation about the potential impact of you know, this, uh, what we've described, incursions by China in the South China Sea, um, illegal fishing. I don't know if you or the Department of Agriculture has quantified 
the impact of those in terms of degradation of biodiversity or destruction of fisheries resources? Because I did see in the presentation there was some data. I wanted to see if it's, there was some quantifiable figures, yes, which shows the impact of these, you know, the swarming, we've filed protests on that, ma'am. So I just wanted to see uh, in, terms, in terms of figures. Thank you. I, I guess you, I would refer you to many of the um, economic valuation studies on coral reef groundings and the issues of, uh, of production. But I would basically say that in terms of production in the KIG and Masinlok, the paper of Hazel Arceus, now with UPV, is the one I showed you the data for, is basically the numbers we have for the potential of the area. And they were very high. For the particular side of the South China Sea, which we are claiming as KIG, I would basically say there are not really very substantial publications on the numbers that you're looking for. But there would be um, some of the projected you can get from studies that have also been done in Vietnam and in Ituaba and um, maybe historical information. Yun lang, uh, if you want to put numbers on it, it would be very difficult to, to actually put the numbers there or even the areas because the quantification is not there. Qualification maybe will be. So Dr. Perry Alino came up with a book called the Kalayaan Island Group. And um, I would also want to refer you to that if you want to see the information that they have thus far. Any other questions from our audience? Okay. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Malu Bartolome from Business Mirror. I'd like to ask if there's any um, agreement now between Philippines and China on fisheries cooperation in the West Philippine Sea because apparently the, the Chinese ambassador made reference to that uh, the other day during the Manila Forum. And what exactly have you uh, agreed so far? I'm not really at liberty to discuss, but I know that it is one of the agenda items in the recently concluded bilateral consultation mechanism and the foreign minister's consultation mechanism. So that was just last month. So uh, those are developing. And uh, what I understand from the fish on the fisheries agenda, there's a submission from China that's being reviewed by the PFAR and uh, the interagency process. So um, that's where we are. What, what's the level of the agreement? Is that the agreement to talk or to have an agreement? Is that the, is that the understanding? That's the whole process of uh, bilateral negotiations. No? So we, we propose our interests, they propose theirs, we find the middle ground. So we're in that process of finding some place that, that we can agree on. Yeah. So. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. I cannot. I cannot understand. Yeah. So um, well, uh, well, exactly, I, exactly. What what have you agreed on to talk to have an agreement, or have you already agreed to have a, um, we're a reviewing, technical group? We're reviewing their proposal uh, okay. as an interagency. Group. So we haven't agreed yet to have a fisheries agreement. Wala pa tayo doon. but okay. it's an agenda item on the BCM, meaning uh. it's one of the areas of discussion. So at some point, baka magka-agreement, pero ngayon pinag-uusapan pa lang. So, so right now, ang meron, pang, ang meron ng ground is to have a uh, to talk continue for... Discussions, yes. To continue discussions. But what about the oil exploration? That's mas, different mas, from a fisheries agreement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> what, what's, what's, more, what's more in the advanced stage of talks? Is it the agreement with, on oil or with, on the fisheries? I'm not in a position to discuss also oil and gas, but there's a, there's also, it's also an agenda item in the BCM. Yeah. Sorry, I cannot. <laughs> okay, all right, because we are all talking about fisheries, yeah. um, so fisheries marine protection. Fisheries is completely different from oil and gas. So, diba? yeah, exactly. Kasi continental shelf yan, diba? So, nasa seabed siya. So, hindi, yeah. hindi, yan, hindi yan yung kasama sa fisheries agreement. They're completely different. Kasi the fisheries agreement would cover the water column. Oil and gas is a seabed discussion. So they're completely separate areas of uh, no, uh, discussion. Has the date been set? 
uh, for the joint exploration talks in May? Just a month, just a month, but no specifics. Thank you. Another question oh, sorry. from La for no Yusek Beate, from Yusek Beate, uh, for Yusek Beate. Um, we know that um, the, the Philippine Coast Guard has had uh, more frequent patrols uh, in the West Philippine Sea. Has that had an impact with how um, fishermen in that area can now more freely fish? Uh, I know, I mean, in the area of Pag-asa, Ayungin, there's more frequent patrols by the Philippine Coast Guard, mm -hmm. but I'm not so sure about the area of Scarborough Shoal. Uh, I think that question could be better addressed by Philippine Coast Guard, but I will just share with you uh, uh, our engagement with the Philippine Coast Guard. Um, Philippine Coast Guards have their own vessels, and uh, early year, in earlier years, when they didn't have that new vessels, all um, monitoring, control, and surveillance vessels of the BFAR were manned by Philippine Coast Guard personnel. But in the case of the uh, Scarborough Shoal, it's a Philippine Coast Guard vessel who patrols that area. Uh, in a sense, they assist the, our fishers. Uh, you know, it's we, what we say before, uh, what's happening there is quite not clear or ambiguous. There are times that there are no harassments, and there are times that they're just left there to, to go on fishing, even in the presence of our neighbor's vessels. However, there were instances when uh, the Philippine Coast Guard uh, vessels uh, patrol the area and keep watch over our fishers as they uh, go on with the fishing activities. And uh, there are also instances, reported instances before, when uh, they, they observe or upon their, their uh, judgment call it would endanger the fishers, they are warned that it's not the best time to go there. So. So I think that is the role of the Philippine Coast Guard, and they have been very uh, diligent in that uh, responsibility. So, so there's no assessment yet on whether our fishermen can now more freely, freely fish in the West Philippine Sea? Uh, what I know lately, there are no reports of harassment. They, can, they continue fishing. But if there is, you know, it's immediately in the press. Everyone knows it. It's being reported. But these uh, a few months, we haven't had reports of any harassment. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry, but we're out of time. Uh, we do encourage our audience, including members of the media, to ask questions. If you have additional questions, to approach any of our speakers directly. Although observing our um, speakers from the National Security Council and DFA, I think a lot of celebrities and politicians can learn from them as to how to answer controversial questions. I'm not at liberty to answer that question. Uh, seems to be the very diplomatic way of avoiding uh, controversial questions. But uh, thank you again so much to our speakers, to our audience and the members of the media for that very enlightening question and answer forum. And finally, to give our closing remarks, we have the president of Strat Base ADR Institute, no other than Professor Victor Andres Dindo Manhit. Thank you, Karen, for hosting and moderating. Karen, we, we specifically asked Karen to help us this morning because of uh, she has a master's on environment. Sustainability. A lot of people don't realize that. Aside from, of course, Masters of Law. So, so double master. So thank you again, Karen, for hosting us. And she's been a good friend and partner of Stratpace. I thank everyone, our speakers, our, our participants, both in session now, face-to-face, -face, but also I think we had a little over 150 participants uh, in Zoom and our friends from media that continuously support us. 
you know, we've been consistent with our stance on the West Philippine Sea uh, since 2012 when we started looking at building a case in protecting our maritime rights, our territorial integrity. And there are various security issues that relates to the West Philippine Sea, including gray zone activities that call for diplomatic and military responses. Apart from this, the country's maritime territory also faces issues affecting its biodiversity and marine resources. Geopolitical tensions have also limited tourism opportunities in the area. I remember one of my trips with my family in northern Palawan. I felt so proud when our fisher folks started identifying where we were moving from island to island and said, sir, you are in West Philippine Sea. Because before 2012, nobody was using that term. That's the first time I used that in 2012 in Singapore. And people were even laughing at me, where is West, West Philippine Sea? I said, those are the seas, the west of the Philippines, based on international law. But as we approach the seventh year of our arbitral victory, this coming July, protecting our seas grows even more critical in these complex times. The 2016 arbitral ruling found that China's land reclamation and construction of artificial islands has caused irreparable harm to the coral reef ecosystem and permanently destroyed the evidence of the natural conditions of various reefs. These unlawful practices are being carried out until the present and, con until the present and continue to cause severe damage to the marine life and ecosystem that make the West Philippine Sea a critical fishing area for the country's food and economic security. Allow me to share a study that we did with our partner, Pulse Asia. When we asked, a when we asked national respondents across geographic area, across demographic area, from class A to E, Mindanao to Luzon to even national capital region, consistent is that we need to fight for West Philippine Sea, but not really for security matters. But it tells you we need to protect the maritime resources and environment in Philippine territory. And second, protect the rights of people and communities in coastal areas. So on top of mind of Filipinos, and these are Filipinos representative of our population. That is what is on top of their mind. That's why we felt in our institute that we needed, you know, we needed to come up with this kind of gathering to discuss, to raise this issue. And we will be publishing soon a study by our dear friend, Dr. Lagman, uh, on these issues. And hopefully also uh, Dr. Onda in the next quarter. Initiatives on marine protection in the West Philippine Sea protect the area's marine life and natural resources. And this calls on the leadership and expertise of scientists and environmentalists to formulate and execute strategies that will sustain biodiversity and develop Philippine marine resources. The environmental degradation of the West Philippine Sea due to unlawful and reclamation activities, construction of artificial islands and intrusions in our exclusive economic zones cannot continue. Tourism initiatives such as a Great Kalayaan Expedition by the local government of Kalayaan make the West Philippine Sea more accessible to Filipinos. Increasing and asserting our presence within our territory must be free from threats and harms from other states. In our institute, we believe that the security in the West Philippine Sea in the traditional, non-traditional, and evolving or emerging domains must be acted upon through a strategic and responsive interagency approach. At the same time, national and local initiatives on the environment and tourism must enable a stronger maritime and defense posture to effectively manage security concerns in our waters. Consolidating all these efforts, government, civil society, academia, and the international community in defense of the larger rules-based international order and emphasizes the conservation and preservation of marine life as a shared responsibility. Likewise, this becomes an area of multilateral cooperation among like-minded states. In all these endeavors, the efforts of national and international community to secure biodiversity and promote tourism must, must complement and respect the Philippines' 2016 arbitral victory. Again, good morning and thank you for joining us.
and let's continue to work together towards the protection of what is ours based on a rules-based international system. Thank you. Thank you again, Professor Dindo Manhit. And that concludes our event for today. Thank you so much for everyone who attended physically here at the Manila House. And thank you to all those who attended virtually. See you at the next event. And um, actually, on that note, I'd like to make special mention of uh, the next uh, Stratbate Institute event. Um, we encourage all of you to attend The next discussion would be modernizing Philippine defense capabilities and elevating security partnerships. This hybrid event will be held on May 2, 2023. That's a Tuesday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. at the East and West Rooms of the Manila Golf and Country Club here in Makati City. Also, it will be live uh, streamed on Zoom, so it will also be a hybrid event. Thank you, and we hope to see you at the next Strat-based ADR Institute event.